And it's not that we just are passive. Oh, this is what's happening. I just have to accept it. But there's a, the process of mindfulness involves first accepting what's happening, that this is what's happening right now, and I want to know it fully. Hi, everybody. It's Katie with Rhea Health, and I am here today with a special guest. I'm here with Kevin Griffin. Kevin is a Buddhist teacher, author, and leader in the mindful recovery movement. And he has authored several books on this topic, and one of which I'm excited to chat with you about today is your book, Recovering Joy, A Mindful Life After Addiction. Um, so first of all, just thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I guess to begin, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about what it is that inspired you to write this book and a little bit about what the book is about. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, I, you know, I, I started out writing One Breath at a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps, and that kind of introduced me to the world in a way and and got me invited to teach a lot of places and, and at one point I was teaching at the Omega Institute in upstate New York and we did like I think it was like a five-day retreat and not a silent retreat more of a workshop we would meditate but then kind of work through step doing step work and it was a it was a really rich retreat where I felt like people were going very deep but at the end I had this feeling in the room of heaviness and I felt like people weren't really understanding that like kind of going deep into inventory work and self-examination <clears throat> wasn't meant to leave you in some sort of dark place I and, and and as I saw that and I, I had an assistant who I'm very close with and she and I chatted about it and I started to talk about saying, you know, maybe I need to write about this. And it, you know, it, it made me think about, you know, I've been in AA for many years. I don't usually say that publicly, but I don't know if this is fully public, but anyway, um, you know, and, and I'm aware of how people can use the inventory process as a kind of um, self-criticism rather than self-awakening or you know, uh. learning something rather like oh i'm such a bad person and it's even you know so so you know i, I feel like there's this kind of culture of negativity sometimes in the recovery world uh which is understandable i mean you're at you know, we're addicts and we're realizing that we're addicts we're realizing that realization itself is pretty painful and difficult to deal with and but in any case you know it, it it was clear to me that that's not where I, more my program ended. Like, oh yeah, I'm an addict. I'm a loser. You know, I did all this bad stuff. Okay, you know, whip me, beat me, kind of thing. And so, and I had done some work as well with James Barrows, who's another Buddhist teacher who has a book called Awakening Joy. So I kind of stole his title with recovering joy i didn't i didn't even realize that until one day i was i was at spirit rock the center that we both teach at he and i both teach at and we were doing some kind of a kind of fundraiser or something and he he introduced me and then i got up to say oh i've just put come publish this book recovering joy and then he looked at me and i looked at him and i was like oops <laughs> so um it wasn't intentional but it's kind of the same idea. And his book is actually based on an earlier book called How We Choose to Be Happy, which is oh. one of those cheesy titles that I would never have read unless <laughs> somebody had told me about, you know, kind of, he, he had talked about it a lot. And in any case, it, it kind of, uh, a, a lot of my own work at that point, and certainly in my recovery, and, and uh, ha has been uh, dealing partly with depression mm. and also with just this kind of culture of, I'm calling it a culture of negativity. That's a kind of strong term, but we'll just leave it there for a moment uh, in the recovery world that let, for me, recovery really, I had to really find ways to be happy uh, because I, I have a history of depression. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And I tend to, as I kind of say in the beginning of the book, I'm not really like a happy, happy, positive type of person. I tend to be a negative person. But, uh, you know, I, negativity is just sort of like, I don't know. Uh, it's become a joke in a way, uh, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I'm so negative that it's like you can't take it seriously. Yeah. You know, uh, if that makes any sense. Dry sarcasm, it sounds like maybe. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of that. And that's, you know, how I was trained by yeah. my four older brothers, you know, who were, uh, you know, our family was full of sarcasm and that kind of giving each other a hard time. And, and so all in all, I, you know, I just thought, I think I have something to say on this topic. Um, and, I, and I'd like to get into it. And, I, and I'll say, finally, I mean, you know, I warned you that my answers tend to be long, but um, the, the last thing I'll say is that each of my books has been a kind of response to something that I saw in the recovery community. And as, as I've gone out to be a teacher, in my, the people who come to my workshops and things. I, I don't call them my students, but the people yeah. who come to those things. So, you know, the first book was just a response to seeing how many people struggled with higher power and the 12 steps and the language and, and my wish to kind of help them to try to see that through the lens of Buddhism. Mm-hmm. And my second book was really just about higher power. It's called A Burning Desire. And that's because so many people, even after my first book, which I thought explained everything, uh, people still had questions about higher power. So that became that. And then again, you know, the, well, the, I have a workbook because people were like, well, how do I do it? So I wrote a workbook. You know, it's a headache trying to write and just satisfy <laughs> people with all their needs. Never ending cycle, it sounds yeah. like. Fortunately, <laughs> because I love to write and, you know, it's also part of my living, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So you were talking about how like we might be beating ourselves up in the process of really doing inner work as we're overcoming this dependence. Um, And I know in the book you talk about how as adults, many of us even forget that we're capable and deserving of basic happiness. Can you say more here and how it is that we can forget something like this when it's something that so many, if not all of us are after? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, this again, I think is somewhat cultural, but beyond the recovery culture, but really maybe Western culture, this idea of sort of ambition and uh, striving that, that seems to be built into our culture that, um, you know, I, I think I, I tell this story, I'm not sure if I tell this story in the book about, about working with this uh, Nigerian musician who was a really amazing uh, musician and artist, uh, also a madman, but well, so many of us are, um, who he would get on, on stage, you know, the rest of us in the band were Americans. And on stage, he would introduce a song by saying, this is a beautiful song that I wrote. And we would all kind of cringe, like, you're not supposed to, it sounds like you're bragging, you know. But we realized, like, because we then we, we met a lot of other Nigerians because they would come to our shows and he had a lot of Nigerian friends. We started to realize, oh, that's just the his culture. It's not considered gauche uh, you know to to sort of brag about yourself or we, i would call it bragging but you know to, to sort of uh say positive things about yourself in public right yeah uh and so i really think that we partly just have a culture where we're not supposed to think about ourselves in positive ways we're always supposed to like be self improving ourselves and yeah. it's we're never enough and and uh yeah so so i just think that it's we're kind of trained in that way from from i don't know if we're you know anybody has to tell us in yeah. childhood because we see it all around us this sort of humility that's oftentimes really not humility that's that's more shame yeah 
I don't know if I quite answered the question. Oh, well, it was about happiness and I kind of went off into, so think, uh, thinking about ourselves. So, so when we don't think of ourselves as being worthy, then we don't think of ourselves as deserving of love, of happiness or love, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> sort of a logic there. It's like, well, I have to keep doing better and, you know, I can't stop and enjoy myself. I can't relax. If I stop, I'll, you know, everything will close in on me. And, and uh, you know, I, I work with college students uh, in a couple of different settings and I see that and my daughter is in college right now and I see that really intensely now in in the college world of you know students well high school and college where there's just this sense of striving and never never doing enough you know yeah there's this you know and that's kind of built on economic fear but that's a whole other yeah yeah well and as you were describing that i just felt myself like closing off Mm -hmm. and so i feel like this whole experience that you're talking about this internal experience where we're own where our we are our own worst critics, um, that can really suck joy out of us. And uh, you talk about joy, obviously it's in the title of the book and you talk about it a lot in your book, Um, but what does it mean to experience true joy? And and a follow-up to that, how is it that addiction blocks people from experiencing that even when they're out of the grips of addiction? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> I have a b- bad memory so because I'm old and so if I forget to answer the se- the second half of the question I think is a good part but but uh, now I forget what the first half <laughs> <laughs> sorry I'll do one at a time what is <laughs> what is joy and what is right, it right. to experience joy so that's that's a really good question because I uh, I think we I, I, it's not actually my favorite word for describing oh. quite uh what I'm talking about uh, it's almost more like I'm talking about contentment, I think, um, which in kind of Buddhist terms, that's actually a higher form of happiness than elation, you know. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so I, th- there's a couple things. I, I talk about, I t- try to define happiness in the book too. And first of all, I think we associate a word like joy or happiness with some kind of rapturous ongoing state, you know, just, you're just like smiley, smiley all the time. And that's not at all how I think of happiness. Happiness I think of as your life is in order, you know, your life makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. The, 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 the important things in life are, are somewhat in order. You know, you, your relationships, your family stuff, your work world, your creative world, and that you have a, and, and that maybe you have a place just to be playful or activities that you do, you do for no purpose other than to enjoy them. Yeah. Uh, and so that's kind of how I break down the book, like taking these different aspects of our lives and thinking about what would make them satisfactory Mm -hmm. not and it's not to suggest that we're not going to have moods ups and downs and difficult and painful times but that even in those difficult times that we can sense that things are okay and i have that line early in the book where i say at, at some point i said something like i'm depressed but i'm not unhappy Meaning that I was really having a hard time with my mood, but I didn't feel like there was something wrong with my life that needed to be corrected. You know, so the, that's that's one thing. That to me is kind of the happiness. Like my life is kind of makes sense. It kind of works. It's like you know, and obviously nothing is permanent there because you know health and jobs and relationships are all constantly changing, and so you know, there's going to be ups and downs with that. But I guess I would say joy for me is more like in the moments, the kind of the moment of, ah, sweet, you know, and, and what's really important with them and where mindfulness comes in is to really be aware when that's happening and really appreciate it happening. 
to enjoy the joy, if you will. Yeah. Um, so like my, uh, you know, pastime that I do just for fun is I play golf and I, it, I, I played a lot of golf when I was a little kid. I came from a very privileged background and, and then I became a starving musician and I forgot all about it. And I kind of rejected it for all its kind of cultural trappings and, you know, oh, that's just for old white guys. And then I became an old white guy <laughs> and I figured, well, what the heck, I might as well. If the shoe fits. <laughs> yeah. And I, and really I just kind of, I took this course, this awakening joy course with James Barrows and that came up as something I wanted to do. And, and I was kind of embarrassed about it, you know, because like, well, you know, Buddhists in Berkeley, like, they're, not, you know, that's not really a thing for them, right? They should, if they're going to do a sport, it would be like ultimate frisbee or something. <laughs> you know? uh, but uh, you know, I started to play golf, and and I'll have these moments where I just and I and I do it intentionally too, where I just stop and I look around. I love golf courses; they're kind of this you know, they're a creation, a human creation, uh, like trying to kind of create this uh, uh, sort of um, uh, platonic ideal of earth, you know, like yes. ah, the perfect fields and trees and every, you know, and it's sort of, so sometimes I'll just stop and go, this is just really beautiful. And, you know, Wow, that feels really good to just be out here. Because the other thing about golf is you spend a lot of time outside, you know, and yeah. wow, the sky, you know. The, uh, I mean, I was playing last week when I love to go out when it's raining because nobody else is on the golf course. So I went out on this rainy, windy day. And nobody was on the course. And I'm playing and the wind is blowing and then the clouds will break. And then I'm on the 15th green and, and hail started to come down. Oh, my gosh. And I was like, this is great. Magical. You know? I mean, it's just fun. You know, I was dressed for the occasion. And so it was fine. The next hole, there's this, you know, the sun comes out and there's this huge rainbow. One of the biggest rainbows I've ever seen, like just thick and just full arc. And I was just like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And I'm just wow. out here. So uh, that's the other thing of joy is like, find it where you can, wherever it is, you know, yeah. have those moments of joy. So those are the kind of balancing to me. We have these moments of elation that we want to enjoy, but we, we can't sustain that. Yeah. So then the bigger question then is happiness and do I have a life that could have make sense? Yeah. And you talk about your golf experience in your book. Um, and there's a question I have for you there because, um, you know, as we break free from the grips of dependence, um, you talk about in your book, how we have to kind of discover new ways of being and coping and things to enjoy. And it can be challenging as adults because we're not used to being beginners. Like you had to be a beginner again with golf. Yeah. Um, and I think you have a story in your book where um, the fear of not being good enough just prevents people from taking action when when something could bring joy like with the golf you had that magical experience on the course and had you have felt not good enough you would have never been out there um so can you speak about this and how that fear that we have in adulthood might prevent us from experiencing true joy and engaging in things that we love and you know how we can identify that and be aware of that yeah i actually want to just talk about one other thing related to that first, Please do. Yeah. which which you got triggered when you first asked that question, which is that, as you know, particularly with opiates, if you're if you become addicted to opiates, it actually makes the like pleasure receptors in the brain it kind of disables them, and this is one of the problems with recovery, oh. particular for opiate addicts. It's harder for them to actually feel pleasure. So it's not even just like a psychological thing. It's actually a brain, the effects of the opiates on the brain. Because they, because we have, you know, we make our own opiates in, yeah. in our own body, right? But when you take, take opiates, your body ceases to make those pleasure chemicals anymore. And then I don't know if that can be recovered, but I know that's one of the big problems of why opiate addicts tend to relapse because they they have a really hard time having actual sense pleasure. Wow, uh, I didn't stop. know that. Yeah, you should know that, but now you know. 
Yeah. And you should look it up because I'm, I make up all kinds of scientific <laughs> stuff. That's not true, but I, that one's, that one's, that one's true for sure. Um, but the, but this other question, this more general question of why we can't allow ourselves to kind of have fun, I, you know, yeah. it goes back again to this sort of feeling that our work is never done, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I was telling some college students last night uh, that they have a club at, at Berkeley um, where they practice mindfulness and I go in and teach them from time to time. And I was talking about how, you know, when you study for an exam, you should stop <laughs> at a certain point. Like, don't, uh, don't study, don't stay up late the night before an exam studying don't cram and do not study in the morning of an exam because you're filling your head with too much stuff that actually blocks your capacity to remember you know, uh-huh. you know when you're, uh, uh, um, you you practice meditation yeah so you notice that when you're meditating things will come up that you hadn't thought of for a long time Mm -hmm. or inspirations will come up or like, Oh, I just remembered I'm supposed to do that thing because when we make a little space in our mind, other stuff bubbles up. But when we keep the mind really busy, it blocks stuff. So if you're anxious going into an exam and your head is filled with a bunch of stuff that you're, that you've just stuck in there, there's no room for the actual memory to function the way it should. Um, now and I know so, why I did so badly on tests in college. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anxiety, you know, just blocks so much. Yeah. So, so this is sort of the same thing in terms of how we live our lives. We're so busy trying to do everything that we don't leave space for the possibility possibility that you know maybe maybe we don't have to do everything. I mean, I'm you know I fall on the laziness end of the spectrum. So uh, I might overemphasize that, but I do find like when I give a Dharma talk, I don't usually prepare a lot for it. Like, I mean, we're having this conversation, like I don't really have to like, Oh, call me later. So I can think about what you just asked me, you know, like it's all in there. Yeah. And, and, so it's it's more to me taking space and quiet time and relaxation time is what rejuvenates you. I mean that's the whole point of the Sabbath, right? The Sabbath was supposed to be a day when people just didn't do anything so that they could rejuvenate. Mm-hmm. And, and rest is really unappreciated in our culture. You know, Americans sleep less than any people in the world. Yeah. We're, we're notoriously uh, um, under, what do we call it? Sleep deprived. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, this is all part of a, a story, right? I mean, we're kind of weaving here that, and, and we don't realize, like, I, I used to work at a tech company doing technical writing, software company. And you know, the culture of software companies is work, 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 right? Work 16 hours a day, hours a day, hours a day, a day. That after a certain number of hours, probably eight, <laughs> and, and some, you know, you stop being productive. And what you, you wind up as a coder, you know, you're working all night. And then you, the next day, you're cleaning up all the mistakes you made in the code the night before when you were, you know, so it's that kind of work smart, don't work hard or whatever it is yeah. that, you know, that, that, that I think people miss. And then if you live, if you live like that, you have space to do something that's fun. You know, you, you have room. I mean, I can, I think I'm really pretty productive and, and for my age, I mean, you know, I've written five books. I'm working on a sixth book in the last 15 years. And, uh, you know, been traveling around the country that time and, um, you know, teaching, uh, teach year round. And, but I have a huge amount of space in my life. I mean, <laughs> partly that's, you know, uh, being a meditation teacher, you know, it is kind of a requirement for the job. <laughs> well, and you don't work, eight, except when I'm yeah. teaching retreat. Yeah. Uh, I'm not working 
all you know eight hours a day but but i just find that having space particularly writing you know be any kind of creative work you know when people talk about writer's block writer's block is when you sit down like okay i'm gonna write a book okay i need to get this done okay let's go you know i don't think like that yeah like i get an idea and i go oh that'd be good oh and then i think of like a sentence or an opening and then I start to write and then I just see what comes. Yeah. And when I, you know, I put them out. I, someone was talking to me about this the other night. I was talking about writing at one of my talks. She came up and said, well, I'm working on a memoir. And, uh, uh, you know, she was kind of asking me like, how do you get your work done? Because I've been talking about it. I said, well, what I do is I kind of set up a structure like either I'll work for two hours a day or I'll write a certain number of words a day and then I'm done. But it turns out that if you write, let's say you write a thousand words a day and a typical book is maybe 50 to 75,000 words. Well, that's 50 to 75 days. (laughs) You know, that's not very long. Yeah. Uh, You know, and so uh, uh, it's, I just think there's this that our striving and all our effort gets in the way of of actually being productive, which then gets in the way of having time to be happy. And uh, you know, I could have I could answer your question probably a bunch of different ways. That's just yeah. the way that came up this morning. Yeah, and I, I come back to it. Exactly what you said. Just like that that striving. I know for myself personally when I was the more I try and go after and achieve like the, yeah, the less clear, the less present, the less joy I feel. And it just sounds like, you know, from what you're saying, when you have that space, joy can arise unexpectedly. Um, You just have to give yourself the spaciousness and it is a cultural thing. It's, it's hard for a lot of people to do myself too. Yeah. So how is it, um, I watched an interview with you where you talked about how when you were in your own um, experience of addiction that the Buddhism wasn't really going to help you much when you were still a dependent on substances. So how is it that being dependent on a substance kind of blocks that experience of joy and connectedness and all of those things? Hmm. That's a good question because why do we take drugs and alcohol except to have joy right? yeah uh that's sort of the whole point i mean um and and certainly it's not that i never had fun drinking and using yeah it's really the it's the addictive quality of it um although even now, if I see somebody who's kind of drunk, they don't, their condition isn't something that I would call joy or happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, intoxication, uh, you know, an altered state, and it it doesn't really, it doesn't really satisfy Mm -hmm. anything. Uh, and that's kind of how addiction happens. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, binge drinking is very much like chasing something. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a couple of drinks and then you kind of like, well, you want to have more. And, and, and it just sort of, it, it's this self-perpetuating energy that they call the phenomenon of craving in AA. Um, and so there you know there's this i mean it's kind of the the you know what addiction is which is just this it's never enough mm-hmm. so it i think cocaine is probably the the best example of that you know cocaine is this like drug that just sort of makes you want to take more but you're really uncomfortable i mean i you know it's weird um, so, so, um, you know, there's that, there's that experience of like getting loaded and then there's the after effects. So in terms of like not being 
comfortable or happy. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you're, you have this craving to drink or to use, and that's uncomfortable. And then you start drinking and using, and you're just kind of becoming intoxicated, which you think is pleasant, but, you know, if you really examine it, if you were actually mindful <laughs> of it, you'd realize it's not. Mm-hmm. And then when it wears off or the next day, you know, you have your hangover or whatever. I, uh, I had a, there was one point in my twenties when I decided to stop drinking, uh, which didn't mean I stopped smoking pot. So I wasn't clean and sober, but, but I, I didn't drink for about six months. And I remember distinctly the first time I had a beer after that period. And I was in a bar in my hometown like the band I'd been had broken up and I'd come was like staying with my parents and went out to this bar to see this band that I knew the guys in the band. And, and I ordered a beer and I drank this beer and I felt like I'd been poisoned. Wow. It, I felt the alcohol as poison, which it is. Right. And yeah. that's how, that's why it causes the effect it does. But as an alcoholic, which I didn't realize I was, but I had a very alcoholic response, which is I know how to get rid of this feeling. Have another beer. (laughs) Because after a couple, then you start to feel happy. It's kind of like smoking. You know, the first time you smoke a cigarette, (laughs) you're getting sick and then, and then, but you keep smoking until you become numb to the effect. Yeah. That's so interesting. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's almost like that chasing and living in the future. Would you say that um, you, you can't really experience joy if that's your mindset all the time, if you're looking for the next drink or looking for the next hit or, or resisting it, um, right? Or what would you say? I, yeah, I've, absolutely. I mean, so, so there we have the subtitle of the book, Recovering Joy, A Mindful Life After Addiction, right? <laughs> mindfulness in, in which yeah it's probably about time we got around to that <laughs> <clears throat> mindfulness is about being present with what you're experiencing and that means yes you can experience joy it also means you can experience pain or discomfort or emotional pain and that you can be with that without being overwhelmed, that you can kind of hold the whole of life. And so that I think is the most important of these teachings in terms of living clean, is that not only can we hold everything, not only can we be present for everything, but everything is worth being present for. Mm -hmm. And so thus I'm depressed, but I'm not unhappy. You know, it's like, I'm still alive. I'm still, uh, you know, uh, engaged in my life. And and so mindfulness, which really takes training. I mean, you can be mindful with very little training, but to be fully kind of to work with all the nuances of our experience, in a mindful way really takes time and because one of the things that I find as a, a mindfulness teacher is that when I teach people meditation, they are very happy with the part that makes them feel relaxed or, uh, you know, spacious or um, contented or happy. But if they start to feel something uncomfortable, like something, thing in their body starts to hurt or their mind gets really restless or agitated, then they want to know how to fix that. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I'm like, no, mindfulness isn't about fixing stuff. You can um, work with it uh, and work towards uh, relieving that discomfort. But if you're trying to fix it, you're not being mindful. You're trying to control. And, and that comes out of an aversion. And so desire and aversion are kind of the two uh, main 
problems with the the mind that and this is what the buddha kind of pointed to what causes our suffering is our craving for things to be different from the way they are which is either a craving for pleasure or a craving to get rid of displeasure or, or you know something uncomfortable so mindfulness to to really live mindfully means to be able to be present with the you know range of from pleasure to pain and to not be agitated by it so that state is called equanimity this kind of balanced mind that's open to you know you take everything in and that's you know exactly the opposite of the addictive mind the addictive mind is all about controlling and fixing and making things the way they want it and this doesn't just involve substances that you know there's a this is a typical human behavior i'm going to control things i'm going to fix things you don't and, and that's kind of how our minds work mm -hmm. which is fine i mean that's that's life you know you're naturally in life you're going to try to make things more comfortable but when we're driven by those impulses and with no consciousness then we are in a state of agitation all the time Mm -hmm. which sort of sounds like what we were talking about in terms of work life and being striving and not, you know, so, so this um, practice of mindfulness really has a lot of depth that sometimes gets missed, you know, and, I, and I've kind of been, uh, the la my last couple of talks, I've been kind of trying to point to these things the the idea of really, when you're meditating, observing all the different mind states and all the different kind of moods and things that are coming through and trying to be not to suppress them or push them away or get away from them. Like, oh, I'm having that. Let me come back to my breath really quickly. But yeah. rather, oh, let me just see that and be with that. And then I'll come back to the breath, you know, and then and maybe I'll see if there's a strategy for working with that, which is fine. Again, it's not that we just are passive. Oh, this is what's happening. I just have to accept it. But there's a, the process of mindfulness involves first accepting what's happening, that this is what's happening right now, and I want to know it fully and be with it fully. And then, knowing it fully, I want to see if there are ways to skillfully respond to that. And, of course, the teachings, the Buddhist teachings and mindfulness teachings in general, have many skillful ways of responding, but responding is very different from reacting. And that's kind of the essence of the practice. Very well said. Um, yeah. So something you said in there about how when someone's meditating and they're uncomfortable and they want to fix the position or whatever to get more comfortable. I think with a lot of people who've struggled with dependence, you know, we've used substances, alcohol or whatever to escape uncomfortable emotions and feelings. Um, and that kind of transition into someone who's using substance regularly to escape feelings into someone who now has to kind of find new ways to cope on their own. Um, how does somebody navigate that with as much ease and grace as possible i know it's kind of a loaded question but i've seen that be the really big challenging point that that uncomfortable emotion that you've numbed out for 10 years it's like you have to finally face it's the only way out is through right um how does how does somebody bridge that gap and start to experience these things without pushing them away very carefully <laughs> what's the recipe here <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer a friend of mine years and years ago when I was, I was in a band uh, and this guy said that he had gotten his taxes audited and he was claiming that he had only made like $800 for the year or something. And the tax auditor said, how could you live on $800 for a year? Very carefully. <laughs> uh, always liked that line. But anyway, um, I mean, this is what, recovery programs are all about and treatment programs are all about and practically every book about addiction is about how do you get from here to there you know 
how do you get from being an addict to quitting to and not relapsing because of the challenge of being with, just as you said, all the feelings that you'd been suppressing all those years. Now they're coming up because there's no protection. Mm -hmm. And this is what, this is why I don't present a recovery program (laughs) because I did it in through the 12 steps. You know, I went to a lot of meetings. I, and, uh, well, uh, not initially, but, you know, once I got committed, I went to a lot of meetings, worked with a sponsor, worked through the steps, and it took years, you know. And, you know, it, there's like these stages of recovery. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why if you go to the 12-step program, you know, they give you the chips for mm-hmm. you know, 24 hours and, 30 days and 60 days and 90 days because they're trying to really keep people motivated and also to really point out that these are major landmarks, you know, milestones, I should say, in in the process because that first year and the first two years and the first five years, you know, <laughs> the first 10 years, I mean, each of them kind of has its challenges. So the when I, you know, I've been asked over the years what I think is the most important quality or thing to have, you know, most important thing to to create success in recovery, and as I've reflected over over on it over time, what I've come to is that the most important thing is the desire to be in recovery. Mm. It's not, there's no, you know, therapy or, you know, step or some, anything anybody can do for you. It's, this is why the, one of the lines you hear in 12 step meetings is the people who make it are the ones who want it, not the ones who need it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really true. When I got sober, I just, I really, I was at the end. I I had tried everything, you know, I had tried Buddhism and I, and therapy and, you know, every little spiritual uh, sidetrack that you could try back in the seventies, you know, (laughs) and I just, I, it wasn't that I wanted to be sober though. I just wanted to be happy. And Mm -hmm. And the first day, and I think I tell that story in Recovering Joy, my first day sober, I was happy. Yeah. I, I, I just felt good. I was joyful. You know, I was in a good mood. Uh, and my life was a mess, you know. Uh, so, I, so in my, de- my definition of happiness that I gave you before is not really what I mean. I just felt good. I was in a good mood. And that was very striking to me because I'd been dependent on drinking and smoking dope for many, many years and to like wake up and go, I'm done. And Hey, it's okay. was a huge revelation. Um, but I just, I don't, I don't think anybody can kind of, um, you know, you can't recreate anybody else's recovery. Like that's one of the flaws that people, somebody's worked the 12 steps and they've done it a certain way. And they're like, this is the way to do it. And so everybody that they sponsor or work with or meet, they tell them this is the way you do it because it worked for them. Mm-hmm. And one way doesn't work for everybody. So everybody has to find their own way. So, you know, I, I understand from Sarah that you guys work with, um, harm reduction more more than an uh, abstinence program and you know i have a lot of questions and doubts about that but that's just based on my experience and i it, it makes sense to me at the same time i understand like yeah for some people they just need to be able to get to the point where they're not killing themselves mm-hmm. so that they can you know move on yeah and and so uh, one of the unfortunate things about the recovery world is that there are these different camps. The 12 step people are like, that's the way you have to do it. And the treatment programs are like, no, you've got to go through treatment. And then harm reduction, like, no, you should do harm reduction. And, 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 and then the, the researchers are like, well, research shows this. And, you know, and nobody, 
even talks to each other, much less works together. And my view is nobody's figured it out. You know, if somebody had figured it out, they'd be a billionaire and, you know, and everybody would be flocking to them. But we know that there's no recovery program that has any kind of significant uh, success rate. You know? And so I think we should all listen to and learn from each other. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, I think the thing that gets someone through is that they really want it, want it. And that's why people often have to relapse before they realize, oh, it doesn't work. You know, mm -hmm. drinking and using just don't work. I really want this. I, I want my life back. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more because I've, yeah, I've seen a lot of people um, through our program and otherwise that their spouse wants it for them or they think they should want it. And it's just amazing the difference when somebody is coming at it from that mindset as opposed to like, I want this, it's going to work for me no matter what. It just changes the whole experience. Well, it's why your parents can't get you sober, no matter how much yeah. money they have and how many, you know, like elite treatment centers they send you to. If yeah. they're wanting you to get sober, doesn't create wanting in you. That's why I, I think, are you familiar with motivational interviewing? Yeah. That's what I think. I mean, I don't know much about it, but the concept is exactly what I think. Oh yeah, motivate, get people motivated because uh, that's it. If they're, yeah. if they're motivated, they can do it. Anybody can get clean. And it's one of the reasons I, I don't like the idea that, oh, you have to take, you know, opioid addicts can never fully recover. They have to take, you know, methadone or suboxone for the rest of their lives. I'm like, if they really want it, can't they have it? And, and that's where apparently this argument about the, the opioid receptors in the brain that, that they lose that function. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, a, a time heals a lot of things. Yeah. I know in your book and otherwise you talk a lot about the significance of time spent in inquiry and reflection. And I'm just curious if you can provide some good questions that people can start asking themselves um, to get on this path of recovery and healing, because just speaking from my own experience, um, I wanted it for years, but I kept stumbling and kept screwing up and trying and failing. Um, I couldn't figure out how to want it enough to like really commit to it. And I'm just wondering if you can provide some good thoughtful insights that people can, you know, play with or use for themselves. Well, I'd love to come up with something. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I think the most, the simplest question is, am I really enjoying this? Because mm. you know, um, we, you know, we call it partying when we get loaded, yeah. but you know, that's something you might do for a time, but for somebody who's really an alcoholic or an addict, the party's been over for a long time and, you know, you just didn't notice that everybody left, you know? And so I think that sort of asking yourself, I, I think there's two things. One is, you know, is this really working for me? Is this making me happy or what am I really getting a lot out of this? And the other is, do I believe that it's possible to recover and that, that I could have a better life? Do I believe I could have a better life? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I knew one person uh, who was sober before I got sober and he was a musician and he was a songwriter and hanging out with him and working with him was one of the really important parts of deciding to get sober because I had always imagined sobriety as this gray, flat, boring world of kind of losers, you know, in raincoats in the basement of a church, you know. And here was this guy who was vital and creative and fun, you know, yeah. having fun, happy, um, un, a sort of unbothered by uh things and uh i thought wow 
So that's what it, it looks like. Like I never knew. You know? So having some vision of that, I think, I think there are a lot more positive images of recovery now than there were in 1985 when I got sober. Uh, we know about so many artists and musicians and yeah. actors, things that are clean that seem to be doing well. So I think those, those two things, like really asking yourself, is this working for me? And, you know, can I imagine something better? You know, the step two in the 12 steps is I was talking about on Friday night. One of the things that it's, it's saying when it says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. One of the things it's saying is we came to believe in our own potential for recovery because that's another thing that gets in people's way. Oh, other people could do it. I can't do it. I mean, people say the same thing to me about meditating. I could never do it. It's like, you know, as soon as you say that you're, it's a self perpetuating, you know, self fulfilling prophecy. And so yeah. Uh, I think people people need to sort of question themselves in that way. Yeah. Question their own potential. And for me, I found like, you know, I, asking these questions to myself in different ways, um, the answers don't come right away usually. And I have to keep asking and asking and eventually the answer comes. So if I'm just diligent and never give up at looking for it. That's right. The, the question about whether this is working for me isn't something that's necessarily answered right away. But if you're asking the question yeah. on a regular basis, you're going to start noticing, oh, this kind of sucks. You know, yeah. I've got a moment of drinking that beer when I realized like this is a taste like a, it feels like poison in my body. It's like, oh, but I ignored that message, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I really want to thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. And I think I just, you know, one last question for you. Um, with your book, Recovering Joy, is there a final message or note or thought or thing you would like to um, share with people is really your intention in creating this book and putting it out into the world? Yeah, I think the intention is to look beyond abstinence look beyond uh, even a program mm -hmm. and, and look for, you know, a greater, a greater life, a life that's really fulfilling. That's not just about, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you could say like sobriety and being clean is about what we don't do anymore, but recovering joy is about what we, what we're going to do now in a positive sense with our lives. That's awesome. Yeah. Great to talk to you, Katie. Yeah. So great to talk with you. I really appreciated the time. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll talk again soon.